Hi, and good morning. Are you uh, as excited uh, as I am? I hope so, because I'm going to demand a few things from you. I'm going to ask a lot of you, because we have plenty of time for debate this session. So at the end of uh, this, uh, this session, we will, I will ask you of your uh, thoughts, of your ideas, and what you uh, got from the, uh, listening to the speakers today. So prepare yourself already for this. And if you are hesitant in doing so in English, you are always welcome to do it in Swedish, and we will translate to Ekaterina if, if you need a translation. You know some Swedish, I know. Um, my name is Rustam Nilsson, and I work at CISA, but I will be moderating this uh, breakfast session. But before we get started, I want to introduce the organizers of this event. We have Per Flink, please, and Lisa Mann. And applause. There you are. The Sustainable Business Hub is a. Ja, nu fortsätter på engelska naturligtvis. <laughs> Men vi är en medlemsorganisation, en ideell förening. Vi har kommuner, företag och akademin som medlemmar, plus Region Skåne. Vi driver olika former av hållbarhetsprojekt. Så det här är ett led i detta. Det här seminariet är det tredje och sista i en serie av tre då som vi har haft om cirkulär ekonomi. De andra två hade vi i våras. Eh, seminariet finansieras genom projektet Circlus som tyvärr inte kunde vara med här idag. Det är ett projekt som ägs av Region Skåne och har sin grundfinansiering från Tillväxtverket. Så väldigt kort tänkte jag säga om Sustainable Business Hub och det har gjort i det här sammanhanget för att ge så mycket tid som möjligt till våra föredragshållare. Så jag ber Lisa säga något om hållbar utveckling. Ja, tack. Jag hade en bild. Ja, tack. Jag ska bara helt kort presentera mig. Lisa Malm heter jag. Jag jobbar för hållbar utveckling Skåne. Också en ideell förening bestående av medlemmar, cirka 80 stycken. Och driver projekt, precis som Systemet Business Hub, inom innovationsupphandling, inom cirkulär ekonomi, matsvinn liknande. Vi har också fyra nätverk och jag skulle bara nämna att vi har nätverket som heter Credinet Syd, tidigare cirkulär ekonomi. Och vi ska ha ett möte den 12 i 12 som ni jättegärna får anmäla er till. Då vi pratar lite mer om cirkulär ekonomi i Skåne. Så det var bara det jag skulle nämna. Tack för att ni har kommit. Tack. Vi får en applåd till. Är ni inte medlemmar i Hållbar utveckling i Skåne så tycker jag att ni ska bli det. Men också i hubben såklart. Ifall ni representerar ett företag som inte, eller en organisation som inte är medlemmar. Jag jobbar på ett företag som heter Sysav. Och vi är medlemmar i båda organisationerna. Så jag är varmt rekommenderande. Jag tänkte innan vi inleder så tänkte jag kolla lite var ni är, inte bara rent geografiskt, för det är ni i Malmö för ni inte visste det, här på Börshuset. De två tidigare sessionerna har varit nere på studio, men det är så jättekul att få vara här tycker jag i den här vackra sal. Utan jag tänkte kolla var ni är när det gäller begreppet degrowth. So, from now on, in English, we're going to start talking about the concept of degrowth. How familiar are you with the concept? And this will give Katarina and Alexander, who will uh, uh, soon speak, uh, where you are. So, if you are super familiar with the concept of degrowth, you know all about it. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. You do like this. <laughs> if you haven't heard about it until today, and this is why you're here, you do like this, right? Like a penguin. And everything in between. So, if you are like, oh, I know a little bit, but I won't brag. You can do like that, right? Uh, so please stand up and show the speakers where you are when it comes to the concept of degrowth. And I'll show you where I am. <laughs> oh, you have some work to do. You have some work to do. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, before I present them, I want just to tell you why I'm here, why I'm, I'm moderating. I work at the waste company. I hope you're all familiar with CSAV. We are the one handling all the waste 
you put in the bin, right? The residual bin for, for combustible waste that we energy recycle. The food waste you put in your brown paper bag that becomes biogas and biofertilizers. Um, why are we here interested in degrowth? <laughs> Well, because I can just give you an example how we, as environmental educators at CSAB, uh, you have different uh, practices to, to test our audience when we talk about uh, waste. Um, when we're in schools, we are there to educate them about something called the waste hierarchy, uh, where you can put stuff to landfill, you can energy recycle it, you can recycle them as materials, you can reuse it, or you can maybe prevent it. This is one of the tasks me and my colleague Jan, who's sitting here too, uh, have when we're out in schools. And for this, we set up a little exercise for kids that I'm going to just give you a quick example of. Let, let's say that you are no longer allowed to throw any waste outside the house you live in. How much waste do you generate? Well, you, as an average Swedish person, you generate 500 kilos of waste per person a year. So if you're a family of four, which is quite average in Sweden too, you generate two tons of waste annually. What would happen if you no longer were allowed to let anything outside of your home? Everything had to stay indoors. You have to handle your own waste. Treat your own shit. <laughs> well, we asked the kids, and naturally they tried to cheat. I would drill a hole to my neighbor. <laughs> I would flush it down the toilet. I would move. I would, I would burn it. Then I go, no, 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 cheating, no cheating. No smoke through the chimney, please. That pollutes the environment. You have to deal with your own waste completely. Then the kids go, I know, I know. I would shop less. <laughs> And I go, I want them to talk because we want the kids to talk because they give us so many great ideas. I asked them, what do you mean shopping less? What that's linked to, how is that linked to waste? Shopping is one thing, waste is another, right? And they started to tell me that you actually buy your waste. And I go like, what, do you buy your waste? Well, the stuff you put in your bin, you, you bought it, didn't you? You're not a thief. So it's linked. The economy and waste is linked. And that's completely true, of course. Uh, when my grandmother was born in 1929, an average Swedish person threw out 30 kilos of waste. My grandmother is still alive. She was born in 1929. So from 300 kilos per person to 500 kilos per person during her lifetime. This means that even though we now are the best recyclers in the world in Sweden, we have great technology for energy recycling and recycling of materials. We're a good system where people can sort the waste. The landfills have dropped from 100% down to 2%. Or for household waste, it's even lower. It's 0.7% of landfill. And we recycle everything. We now impact the climate and the environment more than we did when we dumped everything or buried it in the ground. Or if you can't see it, it doesn't exist, the principles of landfills. Because growth in economy and waste is completely linked. So when the kids, because they are kids, they can be, uh, you know, like kids. They go, I would shop less. <laughs> That's the quick fix, right? And I ask them, how can you shop less? Do you buy stuff you don't need? And they tell me very funny stories about their parents. Uh, <laughs> and one kid once said a really cool story that I like. He said, well, my mom, she has like, she has so many shoes. <laughs> and how many shoes can you really have if you can't throw them outside of your house? If you can't, you can't live, you can't live, you can't have that many shoes. And then another boy in that classroom, he got really concerned now because he heard a different story from his home. He raised his hand and said, but mom, mom, my mother told me you can never have too many shoes. Because <laughs> that's what he heard, right? There is... Uh, a point to the story, of course, the kids tell me about the waste hierarchy, prevention, then maybe reuse, repair, and so on. Circular economy that we're talking so much about today. And they try to recycle a lot of stuff. But, uh, and they tell me also about a landfill, but they call it putting it in my sister's room. That's what they call landfill. But the point to the story is that it's true. 
Of course. We have one house that we all live in, in one family, the planet. This is our home, and there are no waste trucks coming from other planets, <laughs> picking up the trash. So, we are living with our waste, and there's more and more waste generated. So, waste is just one of the examples to describe the link of the problem with growth. <laughs> and the politics today suggests we can decouple this, right? But is that enough? Will that take us all the way? Well, we're going to hear a different story today. So, with that, I want you to welcome on stage uh, two speakers. We have Ekaterina Tcherkovskaya and Alexander Polson. So, please come up on stage and you can see the great uh, presentation on, on the screen here. So, you are for it. The stage. Is the microphone on? Yes, it is. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting us. We're very excited to be here, of course. Uh, and for the next 40, 45 minutes or so, we will talk about degrowth, explain what it is, and give some illustrations on how you can actually uh, do it in practice or engage with this in various ways. Um, is there anything else we should say before we begin? That's it, okay. Yeah, we can begin. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> uh, yeah, you already put that. So we want to start by showing this picture. And this picture, I suppose, is not that unfamiliar to any one of you. Uh, I mean, this picture has been around for four years, soon five years. And uh, we think that this picture is important to start, start with. Uh, because this points in the direction which we all should be moving, of course. Uh, and different organizations, different companies, they focus on different goals. Uh, on one or a couple of these different 17 goals. <clears throat> and uh, um, when you start digging into these goals, you will realize that there are sub-targets and uh, they are uh, fairly it should be easy to assess and how we progress and so on. And uh, there are annual reports on the progress of these uh, goals. And so far, the, the progress doesn't seem very promising. Uh, we're far from reaching the climate target, and we're far from reaching a lot of these uh, targets. Uh, and here we will focus on a few of these, <clears throat> at, primarily to illustrate some of the contradictions and the conflicting goals that are buried amongst these 17 goals. Uh, and this will also give you some indication on how you could prioritize between these different goals, because it's difficult to prioritize all of these 17 goals. So our presentation here could also be seen as a way to uh, guide your thinking on how you could prioritize between these. And if we zoom in on goal eight, which is very relevant to what we will talk about, degrowth, Goal eight is about decent work and economic growth, and there is a lot of sub-targets under this goal. But in general, the idea is that uh, least developed countries, LDCs as we have shortened it here, should grow with 17% um, per, per year in order to catch up with the developed countries, so to say. Um, but if we look at the world GDP and how that has developed, during the past years. Uh, it has been quite slow. Uh, and of course, the financial crisis in 2008-2009 has uh, uh, slowed growth, you could say. Uh, but in some cases, it has uh, catched up, especially in the US and the developed countries. Um, and then if we move on to another sub-target here, or a target under this goal, uh, there is also an idea that we should uh, improve resource efficiency, which sort of highlights what Rustan mentioned before, that there is this idea that we sh should, or should try to at least, decouple economic growth and uh, material throughput, or biophysical throughput. So growth should preferably continue, and then... Uh, material throughput or CO2 emissions, for that matter as well, should sort of uh, not decline, but level out. And that's something you can read into this. Uh, 
And this is then called decoupling, as Gustav mentioned. However, if we look at the figures, this does not seem to happen. Far from happening. On the, way, on the, on the contrary, it seems to be worsening. Um, while growth is slowing, uh, CO2 emissions and biophysical throughput seems to be increasing. So we're actually moving in the wrong direction. And this is also where degrowth comes into the picture, how this could be potentially a solution to this problem and the contradiction. Uh, and then if we move on to goal 12, which is on sustainable and responsible consumption and production, they also talk about the economy to a large extent. Uh, they also talk about the material footprint, how we should um, decrease the material footprint per capita linked to GDP growth, which means that uh, we should use less resources to produce more growth, basically. Uh, and again, there is this contradiction. If we look at the figures and the development so far, this seems to be far from happening. On the contrary, uh, the material throughput and the material footprint seems to be growing bigger, while growth is still quite slow. So we see an opposite development as opposed to what we should be seeing. Um, and if we st still, if we have some growth, even though it's quite slow, say 3%, the material throughput will grow uh, along with that. So a lot of the figures or the, a lot of the goals in these uh, SDGs are at the moment unattainable. We are not moving quick enough in the right direction, so to say. And you could argue that this is partly due to the fact that they are conflicting. If we emphasize growth, economic growth, and see the link to CO2 emissions, material throughput, and how tightly coupled these are, we won't achieve the environmental or ecological goals. Uh, so this leads, you could say, to the conclusion that, okay, but if economic growth is driving all uh, the env environmental degradation, or not all, but a lot of it, and the env environmental degradation, CO2 emissions, and also the waste increase, shouldn't we then look at growth and try to change that or change our conception of growth? And this is what we will talk about during this presentation. So this is sort of the background, and this is to give you a common framework that we can share when we talk about these things. Um, and we can come back to this later on during the discussion as well to discuss how degrowth links to, to these goals. Um, Will you take over? Yes. <clears throat> so now it's then time to introduce the growth. So because if we're serious about um, uh, meeting the uh, environmental sustainable development goals, if we're serious about the uh, climate uh, Paris Agreement, then actually scaling down the uh, level of economic activity becomes a very important task. So, and this is what degrowth is about. But it's not just about scaling down, but about living better, uh, as we will try to show you throughout uh, uh, today's talk. So, what is uh, degrowth? Uh, actually, the word itself was uh, coined as uh, de croissance in French in 1972 by uh, André Gortz, a French uh, intellectual. So, and he referred to the growth or the croissance in response to the uh, limits to growth reports uh, that came out around the same time, also in 1972. So the report which actually showed that there are environmental limits to, the, uh, to, to growth. And uh, the growth existed as a term in different uh, spaces, uh, uh, mostly maybe activist uh, spaces, for example in France and, uh, uh, and other places. And the new wave of uh, discussion of this kind of academic activist discussion on degrowth, uh, it stems from 
the 2000s, uh, so, uh, and 2008, the start of uh, international biennial degrowth conferences that bring all this discussion together can be seen maybe as a kind of point for what has now become a truly uh, international uh, debate. So, very broadly, degrowth can be seen as uh, an umbrella term that uh, critiques the centrality of economic growth and uh, uh, economy uh, in today's societies uh, and brings together alternatives that are both ecologically sustainable and socially just. So, this is the key um, entanglement, let's say, for degrowth, this, uh, uh, that sustainability and justice should come together and one does not really exist without, um, without the other. So, but in other words, uh, a common definition that is used to describe what degrowth is, it is reduction of material and energy throughput uh, while ensuring well-being for all. So it is very important to stress that it is not about reducing GDP, it is not about austerity, or it is not about returning to pre-modern living conditions. It is something different, as we will show you today. So, and it is a very vibrant scholarly discussion and uh, uh, activist movement, and again, the kind of the two come, uh, come together. Art often gives uh, a way to visualize something that is maybe not so uh, easy and not so intuitive to, to describe. So here is an example from uh, the book called Degrowth, a Vocabulary for a New Era, which is a very uh, helpful and important introduction into degrowth uh, discussion. So the economy today is portrayed as this kind of huge elephant that always strives for more and that always wants uh, more, um, and it is uh, growth that is called for, say, in times of uh, uh, recession. So even if uh, austerity policies can be pursued, but the argument would be that, okay, this will bring growth and things will uh, become better. Uh, but the growth is not about more of the same, or same of the same, or less of the same. It is simply different. And snail is a creature that uh, often symbolizes uh, the growth as a discussion and uh, as a movement and set of ideas. It is kind of the creature that uh, moves at a good uh, pace, let's say. So now to start talking about the growth, it is very important to clarify uh, what the problems with growth actually are. So, uh, and there has been a lot of uh, discussion within the growth around that. So we can identify three types of uh, critiques of growth, uh, economic, ecological, and uh, socio-cultural, let's say. So economic is that perpetual growth is not really possible. So if you see the rates of growth, they have been slowing down. Even the countries that have been skyrocketing in growth rates uh, fairly recently, like uh, India or Brazil or China, still the growth is really uh, slowing down. So then kind of to maintain these levels of growth, you need to get into more problematic activities. So more uh, extractivism, exploring the fracking practices uh, or land grabbing and, uh, and things like this. So, uh, and uh, at the same time, GDP is of course this uh, indicator that is used all over the world or in most of the places around the world uh, to indicate how the countries are doing uh, in terms of growth. And it has really become an indicator for kind of showing prosperity. But the problem, and well-being, but the problem is that GDP is a poor uh, indicator of well-being. Um, it does not count the environmentally harmful activities, so all the kind of environmental issues that come together with pursuing growth are not really accounted for in GDP. Or actually, if some environmental um, problems happen, like an oil is spilled somewhere, it can be good for the GDP because it requires a lot of kind of uh, uh, work to actually get it somehow sorted. So also GDP doesn't include a lot of activities that we really consider meaningful in life. So for example, which are not really monetized, uh, but are important for, for our well-being. And very interestingly, the most, the, the person who was um, 
very well aware of the issue with GDP was its founding father, uh, Simon Kuznets, who invented the measure. So when coming up with the measure, he was very well aware of the kind of issues with it as a measure, but he was also from the beginning very clear that it is not a measure of well-being and it is, should not be used as, uh, as such. But then the measure has had its own life kind of beyond uh, what uh, its founder maybe had uh, in mind for it uh, and has really become uh, key for countries, but not only, because you can see that sometimes the um, issues around uh, areas where economy maybe should not be really so central, like education or healthcare, uh, GDP also comes in there and this pursuit of growth comes in there. Actually, I first became critical of growth when doing my PhD in the UK and I could see how the higher education policies were really shaped around this idea of kind of um, bringing up human capital who will then boost growth uh, in, the, in the UK economy. And it has resulted in a lot of massive commercialization uh, of education and lots of other problems that keep coming. So then ecological critique of growth, so this is something that uh, Alexander has already uh, been bringing uh, up. So basically uh, growth has been associated with uh, ecological degradation and we do not see any empirical evidence of decoupling. And if um, uh, there was a recent paper by Jason uh, Hickel who did some calculations, what happens if um, the economy keeps expanding in the way prescribed in uh, sustainable development goals and the throughput will increase so much that we will need six times higher efficiency levels to, do, to decouple than ever in history. So and it has not happened, uh, this kind of level of efficiency uh, increases in history yet and there is no really uh, reason to think uh, that it will be possible. So, and then also the uh, socio-cultural critique of, uh, uh, of growth is that it is a very particular kind of way of living that, uh, that comes with it. So, and it is based on um, injustices too. So, even if today we say, okay, there is a lot of uh, knowledge economy, service economy in uh, Sweden or in the European countries, but actually a lot of this economy is sustained by say, extractivist practices in the Global South, or a lot of the wasteful activity that uh, Rustan has uh, uh, nicely introduced, it also then, even if we can be very uh, uh, good, thorough uh, consumers and then recycle and put everything in the right bins, then it doesn't disappear just like that and then uh, gets uh, uh, recycled or wasted uh, in countries uh, far away from, uh, from us where people work in uh, horrible um, working conditions and uh, w the environment there is polluted by kind of uh, uh, the wasteful activities from the global north. So, and then of course there are um, uh, sustainable development goals do put emphasis on uh, the uh, reduction of um, inequalities, but maybe more so the eradication of poverty, but actually as the work of uh, Thomas Piketty has very powerfully shown, also we have um, inequalities on, on the rise in society. So in that sense, what has been often associated with growth, that its effects somehow trickle down to the rest of the society and people in general become uh, better off, is not really uh, the case anymore and inequalities are really rising. So, uh, and then, yeah, consumerist uh, ways of life, uh, as uh, you would know, <laughs> are, are very problematic and uh, associated with our um, ways of living, let's say, in the European or Western spaces. But the interesting thing that even if you don't really want to be consumerist, it's very hard to uh, live up to the ideals and values that you, that you have. So say if you do not want to um, use too much plastics, you really need to make an effort. If you want your clothes not to have been produced in a way that uh, has not harmed anyone, it's really hard to find such clothes. Uh, or you, the gadgets that you use, which have to be updated constantly with new software and so on, they have also been 
produced in highly uh, unethical ways and even the kind of companies, uh, I would not be naming them, uh, that would stress that they produce kind of fairer gadget products, they cannot really see, uh, say that uh, um, bad practices or uh, horrific practices have not been used in the production of these devices. While actually with also the kind of acceleration that is also part of this uh, growth-centric society, we are always push to kind of change our devices and to constantly update them and ourselves. So I uh, often think about the example that you see on Skona Traffic and Transport, how this uh, girl who has the yo-yo cart is uh, uh, not very modern anymore and she can't find it and then once she gets the app, she actually is like in tune with the world. So that's also the example of uh, kind of how even if you want to be different, then the way the society works pushes you into a particular um, direction. So, so yes, and then the other ways of limbing are marginalized. So whether you are a city dweller, uh, but also maybe more vividly and very vividly so in the spaces where people live in different lives than, uh, than in the European West. So for example, when um, Brazil expands its uh, hydropower and kind of claiming to be uh, pioneering renewable energy, then uh, indigenous peoples uh, are often kicked out from the land where they uh, live and uh, not, their voices are not really heard and then they have to fight back and struggle uh, back. And of course these practices are done in such a way that even if it can be renewable energy that is being introduced, but then it would create other environmental problems uh, that um, have not been there before, such as loss of biodiversity, which is an important issue uh, today. So, yes, then of course the growth is this uh, kind of a bit um, negative or counterintuitive uh, term, as some people would say, because you would have the um, maybe wrong associations when, uh, when you first hear about the word, and then you know to, you need to look a bit more into the discussion to see the different levels, let's say, present in it. So this is why often the growth is discharged uh, as a concept by various um, groups, say policy makers or um, scholars because of the name. So then the question is, okay, are there better terms to, to refer to something that this de Gros describes? And if we look at the kind of uh, concepts uh, towards the um, uh, in the upper part of the slide. So these are the more kind of mainstream concepts that have been uh, used. And uh, arguably all of them are very much geared on growth. So growth is central of, uh, for, for them and this is a problem from a degrowth stance. Circular economy is a bit more interesting because it has this idea of kind of uh, reducing the uh, throughput uh, while making processes more circular, but still it is for growth and then the circularity is not the way the economy works today. So it is kind of can be an aspiration in a way, but it is quite uh, misleading at the same time because if you look at any kind of production and the way it is uh, uh, today, the circularity is nowhere near. So then there are the concepts which are uh, like post-growth or donut economics or prosperity without growth that also uh, start from this critique of growth, but then they can vary in terms of how they see the, the alternative or what a set of alternatives could be like. But also, as we will later uh, refer to, they kind of... Uh, come together and sometimes alliances are built between people kind of working with, this, with these concepts and the uh, degrowth movement. And post-growth is actually very often referred to uh, as degrowth, but maybe not to scare off uh, people one is communicating to. So then, okay, what does system change with degrowth? What would it look like? So, Ecological sustainability, social justice and human flourishing would be at the core of societies. So alternatives are already there, but they are marginalized. Um, the values that come uh, with this uh, uh, degrowth uh, kind of um, imaginary uh, are, for example, care, mutual aid, uh, conviviality and democratic decision making. This is not the whole list, of course, but it gives you some sort of idea that it is a more kind of a, a cooperative uh, society that we are talking about here. So then a lot of activity today is uh, 
very much uh, focused on market and kind of making more spaces, somehow earning money from the little corners you have around. So Airbnb is one example there. So a lot of um, areas are commodified. So in that sense, the point of the growth is to take the activities outside the market where, uh, where possible. So, but then when it comes to economies, it's also a different vision of economies that we have um, in mind. So it is about open relocalization of economies. So in a way, um, the idea is that the very, uh, the long distance trades and the very long value chains, uh, which are sometimes ridiculous and the kind of food that comes to our table has crossed continents several times before, uh, before getting there. So the idea is to produce as much as possible uh, locally, but of course having the kind of trade and connection with the neighbors and maybe at the regional um, and, and other levels. But it is also about open, so it's not about, say, uh, closing as a society and just producing for itself. Uh, it is not self-sufficiency, it is open relocalization. So, and then the kinds of organizations that usually are associated with the growth are not for profit. So, for example, cooperatives, community organizations are the kinds of uh, uh, examples often referred to when talking about degrowth. And very importantly, they are kind of bottom-up and grassroots, but then implemented at different levels. So state, regional, uh, global, munis municipal, and I would say that municipalities, for example, are the spaces that are important in terms of connecting the grassroots to the policy level. And when it comes to de decommodification, there are um, many initiatives that uh, municipalities support. So say, uh, repair cafe in Malmo or maker space in Malmo. So these are supported by uh, Malmo municipality and this is very important. But then of course municipalities often also are part of this kind of strive for digitalization and kind of being part of some smart cities agenda and so on. So the more kind of growth focused things. So in that sense from the the growth stance, these are very important spaces to push change, uh, but then also the kind of practices should be focused away from, from growth. So to give you just uh, some examples, we will not be able to go through, through many, um, but um, uh, food, uh, for example, can be produced uh, very well at a small scale uh, and actually this is how a lot of um, farming uh, communities still live so kind of on the principle of subsistence rather than principle of uh, uh, of growth and there is a peasant agroecology um, which is present in spaces um, in uh, Europe and beyond. So in Europe, for example, there was a very nice study by Nadia Yohannisova who looked at the uh, she called them social rural uh, enterprises uh, in the cases of uh, Czechia and uh, Scotland. So, and she found that a lot of uh, uh, rural kind of uh, organizations, whether family or of other kinds, they live on this principle of subsistence. So, and the photo here is from the uh, via Campesina movement, so the idea that actually this small-scale farming is uh, something that is uh, good for the environment but can also feed the, the planet. So, and then some um, practices like permaculture, urban gardening or foraging are also associated with ways of uh, getting food um, in line with the growth. And you can say, okay, maybe urban gardening, can, it's so small scale and what, what kind of difference it would really make. But actually there are really important historical examples of urban gardening uh, being used to help people survive through the war years. So there were victory gardens in the UK and other spaces during the Second World War. Uh, there was, it was very important practice in the Soviet Union uh, during the Second World War, Spanish Civil War. Uh, we also have this kind of uh, uh, examples. So, but then of course the problems is that uh, the corporate players and the kind of agribusiness dominates the food uh, production and then if uh, farmers also work with big retailers, they are often pushed to kind of produce uh, more so as to have economies of scale, so as to sell things at cheaper prices to the, to the retailers. Then trade agreements, for example, also do not really work for the smaller kind of players, but work more for the large businesses with the, uh, a big lobby power also. 
So yeah, and uh, food waste uh, also uh, doesn't have to be mentioned. So this is actually comes with the system which is focused on producing more. But it can be really avoided by this kind of small scale subsistence production. Then also when we think of uh, energy, so it would be um, renewables uh, or re renewable energy that would be associated with uh, um, socio-ecological transformation in line with degrowth. Uh, but then, uh, you, and you can actually see how it is already happening. So if you look at this map, so this is the map of uh, renewable energy uh, cooperatives across Europe that are part of this network called uh, RS Coop. So, and actually there are more than one and a half thousand of this already. So you can see how this small scale uh, organizations are actually driving transformation and doing something that uh, uh, large players are not daring uh, to do or are doing it maybe with a way which is unjust because even if renewable energy, um, as I have already mentioned, is uh, um, implemented in some spaces, often the voices of the people who live around are not really heard and also the issues of um, energy justice are very important here. So as justice and sustainability should be coming together. But anyway, the uh, organizations that are part of this uh, uh, network, it was very hard for them to be on their own. So because then you are a very small kind of uh, player, not really noticed by the uh, economic processes around you. But then uniting in a network is a way to connect and cooperate and to share the uh, tools and, uh, and knowledge and then to make change uh, happen. So now that I have introduced uh, to you what uh, degrowth is and uh, what kinds of uh, growth uh, it critiques, so in which way it critiques growth and what kinds of alternatives are asso uh, associated with it. Alexander will take you through uh, what degrowth is as a social movement. <clears throat> yeah, since about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there have been a growing interest in degrowth, uh, especially in Europe, but also in other places. Uh, worldwide. Uh, and in Europe, it started roughly in France uh, with some uh, uh, environmental activists being interested in economic issues and uh, trying to promote this idea of degrowth. And this idea has spread, and uh, I mean, we're talking about it here today, but there are also groups in uh, the US, Canada, Australia, and in other places, India, etc where degrowth is actually discussed and where people engaged in these questions and try to put this into practice. Um, and as Katja mentioned, uh, there have been scientific slash uh, activist conferences as well. The first one started in Paris uh, 2008 uh, and there have been uh, biannual conferences since then. And uh, we actually hosted or uh, the conference, the sixth conference of degrowth in Malmö last year, uh, with 800 uh, people attending it. Uh, and then, if you look at the connection to policy making, and I mean, is this something that is seen as totally irrelevant by by policymakers, politicians, and even corporations? Well, depends on how you look at it. To some extent, yes, but to another extent, no. Uh, when I was uh, doing an internship at the European Commission, the Director General of Environment, 10 years ago, 2008, uh, they had a, a unit looking at, or a larger project, you could say, uh, looking into something they called Beyond GDP. Um, so within the European Commission, they were already investigating this, and this has been, uh, of course, they weren't the first one to investigate this and have a project on beyond GDP growth either. Uh, but it shows that there is an interest in, amongst policymakers. Some of the ideas that we have talked about here are actually developed and uh, used to some extent to inform policy making. And last year there was also. Uh, a conference in Brussels gathering uh, academic scholars, activists, and policymakers, civil servants in the European Commission, uh, discussing how to uh, move ahead with uh, degrowth or post growth policies. Uh, and there have also been sort of manifestos on this is what degrowth should be looking like in practice and how we should uh, move ahead with these policies. 
Um, and also, uh, as it says here on the presentation picture, uh, that there are courses uh, in a variety of universities where you can uh, study and learn about degrowth, uh, especially in, in Spain, in Barcelona, and in Germany. Yeah, and this is a beautiful picture <laughs> of uh, when we hosted the conference last year. It took place in uh, Folkets Park, and as I mentioned, uh, around 800 people uh, participated for four days, five days, depending on how you count. Um, and uh, it was a round of sounding success, I would say. And uh, even though the tent is not looking that impressive, perhaps, but you can see from the plenum here that there were quite a lot of people listening and engaging in these discussions. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, there have been these policy proposals written by scholars, also taken up and developed by policymakers in the European Union. And I read in The Guardian on Sunday, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the economist who received the Nobel Prize some 15 years ago, he, uh, he also said that, yeah, but GDP is actually a, a, a lousy measure for measuring well-being. But he didn't really go into the connection to um, environmental degradation and the coupling to CO2 emissions. So, and my experience of the Beyond GDP project in the European Commission was also a bit mm, uh, not so impressive because on the one hand, a lot of people can agree that GDP is not a good measure, but how it is connected to environmental degradation remains a bit of a contested issue. And if you read the paper or the opinion piece by Joseph Stieglitz in The Guardian from last Sunday, he doesn't mention the environmental degradation at all. And and then you have these policies in some countries, the famous ha happiness index in Bhutan, that we should measure happiness instead, how happy people are instead of GDP. Yeah, but that doesn't say anything about the, the environmental degradation that, that we are seeing in a variety of areas. Um, yeah, and the scholarship on degrowth is uh, actually growing. Uh, but, um, but you can see a lot of new publications and books, and we have one book as well out this week. Uh, we can wave it for you later on. Uh, and then, yeah, there's another piece from The, the Guardian. Uh, we don't have to say much more about that, but there, there, there are discussions in the media about these things as well. And almost 300, 238 academics signed this petition. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it was this petition calling the European Union institutions to move from uh, growth to the emphasis on uh, well-being, and actually it was signed also then uh, collectively but by 90,000 uh, people beyond the original signatory. So it's kind of one example where the alliances between scholars uh, are built, so the ones who work in the kind of growth-critical frameworks. So, and also, uh, inspiringly, uh, perhaps, uh, there are new waves of uh, questioning growth that come from uh, activism and scholarship at the same time. So, for example, uh, Greta Thunberg, in her uh, speech to the UN, did mention the fairy tales of eternal economic growth, and, and she has a point there. Uh, and uh, in the scholarly community, for example, there was a, a book just published this year by Václav Smil, who is a very renowned uh, energy scholar who did not write on growth before, but now he has addressed this uh, uh, notion uh, in different and its different phases, and he also makes a point that uh, uh, actually growth must stop, and the economists don't uh, realize that. Uh, Johan uh, Rockstrom, uh, who has been writing, uh, as probably many of you know, on the planetary boundaries, until recently has been uh, a proponent of green growth and was kind of uh, uh, thinking of the possibility of green growth and uh, meeting the planetary boundaries, but since recently he has also, by engaging with the scholarship that comes from the uh, degrowth community, has been um, has started thinking that uh, growth is, uh, green growth is not really a uh, good policy uh, objective, and this is something else uh, that we should move towards. Uh, and uh, 
also 11,000 climate scientists uh, recently um, signed uh, the points that were made in a, uh, an academic paper uh, where they had some issues um, around policy uh, mentioned. So, uh, together with the climate problem uh, that, that we are facing, the climate emergency that we are facing. So, and actually going away from growth was one of them. And something that is not on this slide, but also is very important, there was a global uh, report on biodiversity uh, where also um, the consensus was that uh, it is important to move away from economic growth. So in this sense, uh, it is um, uh, important to see these um, new waves of critique uh, coming and that gives uh, uh, hope that uh, actually it will be well-being uh, rather than growth uh, prioritized. But it requires a lot of uh, uh, action and then um, pushing policies is... Uh, very hard and then making change at a, a small scale is uh, important but it also often meets kind of uh, lots of uh, borders and, and barriers. So to wrap up we have um, uh, started with uh, seeing, um, highlighting the contradictions in sustainable development goals where the pursuit of growth uh, actually is assumed to come together with um, decrease of material and energy throughput, but this is not something uh, that is happening. So then we introduced uh, degrowth uh, as a uh, concept that critiques growth and um, we introduced the kinds of alternatives that come with it. Uh, and then we talked a bit of, uh, about degrowth as a uh, movement and the different levels at which um, the change is uh, strived for. So then we will uh, leave it here and look forward to the discussion with you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. Um, the first two parts of uh, these seminars, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had opposing uh, voices on stage, which okay. may, of course we, we don't have today. So. Therefore, I will have to ask the audience to de today to be, even though you feel con completely convinced and you bought everything <laughs> uh, Alexander and Ekaterina said, now you're going to pretend to be, you know, that grumpy uncle at the Christmas table. <laughs> you know the guy. You know the one who said, that will never work, uh, oh, that's, that's too much, or that, uh, that will never happen, or that's not possible. You know the guy. You all met him. Sometimes... You even maybe you are that guy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and I'll try to do my best just to test your arguments a bit because this is what you need to do also in research and science, right? Course, we have to yes. test your argument. So don't. So you don't. You can say this is not my opinion, but <laughs> if you prefer, I also want to give you a heads up that I forgot to mention uh, when we started. This event is filmed. You saw that in the invitation when you signed up, of course. But if you, by some reason, don't want to show your face, you are being filmed. So talk to the organizers. Uh, try to sit, uh, if you want to have a question but you don't want to be filmed, uh, go in the back and ask the question, then I'll raise your hand, okay? But I hope it's okay by all. I, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. I'm so sorry. For, for. So, let's get started. Uh, I forgot the cloud. Did we write any clouds outside? Um, can you do me a favor and see if we can find some of these clouds for questioning outside? Uh, anybody who wants to start with a question or a critique or a, a point of view, please, you one from Strand Architektur. Please, stand up, you get a mic. Everybody, if you want to be filmed, that's, there's the camera. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to be that grumpy guy. Um, thank you for excellent speech first. Um, if, let's say, we can't leave this uh, market economy that we're, we're stuck in it, so we have to play by the rules. Uh, and how, how do you, what are your views on kind of, uh, if you just raise the price on pollution and extraction of materials and kind of force us to act within that, like during a war, war, war or catastrophes that we kind of quickly adapt to uh, things if, if we have to. 
Um, wouldn't that be possible? And then we couldn't mass produce things at I IKEA or uh, build cars, uh, uh, new cars all the time, millions of cars. And we would have to reuse or re uh, uh, invent what we already have in a much lar larger scale. I mean, it has worked, I think, in recent years with utsleppsrätt, uh, I don't remember the English word for that. Um, in, in, in France and UK, I think they reduced uh, the, the carbon kolkraft. Uh, 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 can't find English word there. But <laughs> no, it's fine. They, they yes. don't use that uh, as much. No, I think it was reduced by 40 or 50 percent. And, and it's even, the, the utsleppsrätt today are ridiculously low. It's not, it's not uh, sustainable, obviously, but still it's kind of working in some places at least. So if we massively increase it, wouldn't it work? What's your view on that? Thank you. Yeah, you understood the question? Or? I think so. Yeah, great. Yeah. Who wants to pick it up? Uh, Should I start? You start. Uh, I think, thank you, first of all, for your questions. Uh, uh, to me, there are a couple of questions in that question. <laughs> uh, one concerns the kind of emission, emission trading schemes for, uh, for polluting the environment, and the other is uh, the, about, uh, the question about the renewable energy and how that is becoming cheaper relatively to uh, fossil fuel energy. And of course, I mean, beginning with the last question, we are seeing that. And I mean, fossil fuel energy production has been heavily subsidized from, for, for, uh, for many years, but, and it still is. But you can see, and as Katja mentioned during her presentation, that you see all these co-ops producing energy locally uh, with renewable energy. And that is, of course, much cheaper than buying fossil fuel, you know, gas, coal, um, uh, to power these power plants. So, so I think you can see that the market is actually driving in that direction because it is cheaper to produce that kind of energy. Uh, but there are opposing forces, so that is a big discussion, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and this is something that is discussed within the, the degrowth uh, community. And the other question is about the, the price, pricing uh, emissions and uh, pricing or putting a cost on polluting. Well, I mean, there are two sides to that, I would say. First of all, I mean, does it just make pollution more expensive or does it actually prevent pollution from happening? Uh, and that's an empirical question. And so far as I know the evidence, the, the reduction in pollution has not really happened. It's just made it a bit more expensive and not that much expensive either because it is mostly used by financial co corporations as an insurance mechanism. Um, and on top of that, you could say that, yes, but putting a price on pollution does, I mean, making that part of the uh, formal economy that continues to drive growth, uh, from a degrowth perspective, you could question that on that premise. Should we actually make pollution part of the formal economy? Um, is it good or bad? And, uh, Maybe that's yeah? rather a roof on the sea of Roof, yeah. Yes, and that has been debated at least in the European uh, emission trading scheme, where the roof has been s that high. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a good question. I don't know if you want to add something to that. Yeah, I think you have very nicely summarized it. So I can only once again highlight that uh, this uh, um, trading schemes, uh, emissions trading schemes, do not mean that pollution does not happen and often involve a lot of kind of... Um, accounting uh, tricks and uh, basically, yeah, so it is paying for it, for the pollution, but, uh, but not preventing it. But isn't that only because we put the roof so high that we, we can't really, we don't really see it say that, okay, we can. Uh, if, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. just continue the question. So it doesn't that just mean, isn't the problem that the roof is too high yeah. if we lower the roof for, for acceptable emissions and so on? Wouldn't that help? That was the question. Right? Yeah, if it works, I mean, who would be against it if it works? But yeah. so far, I mean, what the policies have been doing hasn't really worked in that direction. But, I mean, yeah. If I could add on yeah. on this question, we see it, for instance, with green taxings or uh, taxes on, for instance, when it comes to CISA, we, we handle waste. We now will have probably, it's, it looks like, uh, 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 a tax on, uh, on waste incineration. 
but this tax will not prevent waste from coming in. No. We see that the tax it should, if we would see uh, that it has, will have an effect on prevention, the tax would be at least had to have be 20 times as high yeah. as the tax they will introduce. So we are, it seems like we are willing to pay for emissions uh, beyond the point of where we would actually have an effect. So the, I agree that the, it is an interesting question, but we don't see it has an effect yet on emissions. So, yeah. And you, but can we take legislation and take it into uh, technology perhaps instead then? Uh, couldn't technology help us then? <laughs> because I'm asking this question as the devil's advocate, because this is the question we also get when it comes to waste. Yeah. Um, maybe we could recycle better, we could find better technical circular systems for, for, for the material and so on. Uh, will not technology be the way forward instead of degrowth? Uh, the growth does not um, uh, ch like does not um, challenge technology completely. So technology is part of the growth transformation, but it is also very important. Like what kind of technology and and what for? So when it comes to kind of uh, trusting technology to solve the uh, climate uh, emergency and continue business as uh, usual, so the figures show that it is not really happening and the kinds of efficiency gains from technology uh, are not really helping to, to do not bring decoupling. And then with technology also it is what is very important and discussed in the growth are the so-called rebound effects or Jevons paradox. So when technology becomes uh, uh, more available, uh, its price uh, decreases and then uh, there is more technology around. So in that sense the efficiency gains are kind of uh, uh, outstripped uh, uh, by uh, more of this efficient technology being bought. Our devices and the many devices that we are surrounded by are uh, an example um, there. So, and then the kinds of technologies like uh, uh, carbon capture storage, carbon capture use, so the ones that are expected to be used on massive scale to kind of suck the carbon from the atmosphere and then do uh, stuff with it. So also, uh, from a degrowth stance, these are, not, um, these are problematic technologies with some uh, effects that cannot be kind of, uh, that can be unexpected. So in that sense, such technologies should be uh, prevented because they can create other problems and then also when it comes from the kind of economic uh, reasoning they have also not been really used today and are very uh, very costly but technology kind of as a tool for transformation is also discussed in the growth for example there is connected research on this uh, uh, design globally manufacture locally so the use of technology uh, and the um, kind of uh, digital commons production to connect different people around the world and to design um, objects that are needed to be used uh, to be then produced locally. Uh, so one example that is referred to are the kind of um, easy to produce uh, windmills. Uh, there is this uh, um, uh, practice uh, that was uh, uh, or design that was created by uh, a person who has been living in off-grid communities in Scotland and he figured out how to produce uh, a windmill kind of uh, uh, without having prior expert knowledge and then he didn't have patents on it. So it's something that is actually uh, easy to get access to uh, his, his knowledge. And then the uh, production can take place locally. So this is the kind of technology that is uh, discussed uh, in the growth, but it is very important to still keep in mind that technology does have a serious material throughput and when we're also speaking of going towards services and so on, when it is digital, uh, there is the uh, kind of that, that side of it, not, not to be forgotten. Interesting. Uh, to add on the technology, I, I recently discovered, uh, because when this laptop first arrived as a possibility for me to buy, uh, I said, well, this is smart because th that will, I don't need a TV, I don't need a stereo, I, need, I don't need a lot of devices, so maybe this is a good way forward with technology to lower my impact on the, on the, on the planet. But then I realized, as you said, they are now so cheap, I actually, when I checked, I had five. <laughs> <laughs> so why? So this is part of the problem of technology, yeah. of course, that it's cheap and cheap and better. Per. I close it to. Oh, 
closer, yes. <laughs> I was thinking that the prognosis is that in 30 years we will be 3 billion people more on the planet, which is around, I think, 4 to 4 to 5 percent more than we have today. And I assume that could be an argument for continued growth. So how is that addressed or uh, factored into the growth? Uh, can I add yeah. on to, because a lot of these people are not also the wealthy people we are here in Sweden, can you also address that question linked to the question of poverty? Yeah. Uh, aren't developing countries, do they, don't they need growth? Is, can we tell them not to walk the path we walked because it's a dead end? Or uh, we have been asking them to follow our example and, and look at us as the, the way forward. Shall we now tell them to, no, hold on, yeah. you have to wait? Or, yeah. Please. I mean, first of all, these are very broad questions. Uh, but they are discussed within the, the degrowth community, so to say. And, um, and there are diverging opinions, I would say, about the population issue. There are some uh, scholars and activists who express deep concerns uh, regarding population growth, saying that this will put a pressure on uh, uh, the planet, basically, and the, the resources. Uh, on the other hand, uh, linking this to uh, the development question, if we compare household income with the number of kids, you see an interesting pattern emerging. Because it's not households with many kids that actually consume more. It's households with a high income and few kids that consume much more and contribute to uh, emissions, if we take that as an example. So household income is actually predicting or driving uh, uh, the consumption more than, than kids. You don't buy more because you have more kids, basically. That uh, is based on the premise that a lot of families with many kids are in the least developed countries, of course. But then you have another pattern, uh, that when, you, when your household increases its income, you also have fewer kids over a longer period of time. So you could see a connection here, that, or a development, where the number of kids, or the population, I should say, doesn't constitute so much of a problem. Uh, because those families who have a lot of kids today in least developed countries, if they get a bit better income over the longer period, they will have fewer kids. And the problem is then their income, how they use that to consume goods and services, of course. Which is what we're talking about here today and what we do in the developed countries or the West countries. And this links, of course, to the question of development, because shouldn't uh, least developed countries d be allowed to develop and grow? And this is something also that is mentioned in the uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, especially the goal on economic growth, saying that the least developed countries should be allowed to grow more. Uh, but then, and of course, who could be against that these least developed countries would have a better living conditions? I mean, it would be absurd not to be for that. Uh, but, but then within the degrowth uh, scholarship and uh, uh, speaking for both of us, this is also a matter of how uh, resources are distributed. Not so much about growth, because you can talk about growth uh, to a large extent without actually connecting it to how those resources are distributed. And we see this more as a question of distribution of existing resources than actually growth. Uh, and of course, a counter-argument would be then, yeah, but we need economic growth in able to have resources to be able to distribute. However, I mean, there is a wealth today which is concentrated to quite a few individuals and households. So I think this is more of a matter of redistribution than economic growth in, in order for these countries to be able to have better living conditions. Yeah, I would uh, complement uh, briefly what Alexander has, uh, has said. So there is actually discussion in uh, scholarly communities and activist communities uh, connected to the growth, but in other parts of the world, and especially in the global south, about alternatives to development. Because there is also the argument that development uh, itself, the way it has been going, it actually yeah, has 
privileged particular groups, so the kind of the more uh, privileged ones and not uh, not the others, uh, and uh, and also. In some cases, it has empowered the countries where development came. And uh, uh, how many countries have really developed over the time that development was pushed in, uh, in them? So, of course, it is important to satisfy uh, material well-being and material uh, needs, but the pursuit of growth is not really necessary uh, for it. So, kind of growth as an end in itself is not necessary for it. So, and then another... Um, when it comes to population, I would say that there would be a um, probably emerging uh, consensus that population growth is slowing down, as the work of uh, late uh, Hans uh, Rosling has uh, uh, shown. And actually, in the degrowth, the, also there is the idea that planet Earth is very abundant and there is enough for all. So, and that this, as Alexander has mentioned, a problem of distribution. So it is not distributed uh, equally and then a lot of, say, food and uh, a lot is overproduced and uh, wasted while not getting to the people who need it. So this is the problem rather than the growth of population. Thank you. Any further questions? We have in the back, we'll start at your first, second and third. So you know that I've seen your hands. Fourth. <laughs> Yeah, so we have first. Okay, hey, uh, Susanne Milinkowski, Region Skåne. Well, let's say that uh, I'm an owner of a textile company and I'm positive to degrowth and I want to implement this on, on my company. Do you have, how should I do it? Should I start with making a really proper life cycle analysis and go from there or what would you say? And at the same time, what kind of incitements can the govern government make to make these degrowth movement more efficient or faster? Do you want to start? Um, yes, yes. Thank you very much for the challenging uh, question. So, <laughs> where where would you start? So, I guess it depends on the kind of company uh, it is and what ambitions you uh, you have so from the degrowth stance the idea like th there is often maybe in uh, the idea of scaling up is very popular in the more mainstream and growth centric uh, discussions uh, and then I would say that maybe in degrowth it would be about more horizontal scaling so if your uh, uh, organization does something that is uh, uh, important for, for a space, it is important not to kind of have the ambition, okay, now let's conquer the world with my uh, wonderful idea and with what our company is doing, because similar organizations can emerge in other spaces. And we have that, for example, with the plastic-free stores, as, uh, um, uh, as an example. So they emerge in different places, but actually if they do start growing and if one chain emerges, it would probably compromise the values that they have and that are very important for these spaces. So then kind of it is thinking of how to bring um, sustainability and justice together uh, as, as a company, as an organization, and that would mean... Um, uh, having it worker-led, uh, very important, or having it actually worker-owned uh, and making it, say, uh, a cooperative organization, and then thinking, yeah, where your kind of uh, where your materials come from, and yeah, if it is a textile company and what you produce, it is important, yeah, how how it has come to you. So, and then if you think realistically that okay, it is very important to get this textile from Sweden, let's say, then you can think, okay, how um, Far can I go, but not that far, so I get it from somewhere like so that the value chain is not uh, so so long, and then maybe also with as the process goes on, you can try to improve the uh, the processes and when it comes to uh, LCA and this kinds of analysis. Some organizations are very um, proud to have them, but they can also be used as power tools. So because often these are organizations with resources that have actually the chance to, uh, to make use of them, and they're not so available to the more, let's say, grassroots um, organizations. But then some sort of self-assessment is, of course, um, important. And when it comes to kind of policies and how this can help, so there are some examples around of the Green New Deals, uh, coming uh, coming up in yeah from from 
different uh, groups and one to which many degrowth scholars have contributed is the one by DM25. Uh, movements started by uh, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, Srečko Horvat and other uh, people, but uh, uh, really which uh, in co everyone can join it. So, and there Green New Deal for Europe has this idea of kind of uh, supporting, policies supporting community and court uh, organizations. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and for example, there is a fund uh, that's where the uh, funding that currently goes to, say, large companies or to the fossil industry is channeled to these kinds of initiatives that are important for the spaces where they are based. So, and there are several ways of doing it, but I will not be going into the details, and I'm not also an expert on this kind of short varieties answer. of politics. Short answer, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had the second question there. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Rosenblatt. Uh, I have two things, basically. Uh, they're not really confrontative questions, more thoughts. Uh, a couple of days ago, I happened to uh, interview uh, an environmental activist from Paraguay, who was actually a former uh, minister, environment minister in the, in, the, in the former government in Paraguay. And we spoke about the case that Paraguay has had the highest economic growth during the latest decades in all South America. But still the inequalities are huge, uh, especially between uh, like white mestizo and uh, indigenous people. Whereas, per, for example, Uruguay has had a more balanced growth, but much less inequalities. So growth is, is not necessarily directly linked to, to increases in, in uh, well-being and and like mean economic standard in a country. Um, and another thing that I was thinking of that you might be able to address as well is when we think of how, uh, how the, the environment is affected by our economy, we sort of many ways think of the chimneys of the pollution and taxes, how to put taxes on that. But at the same time, I'm thinking of, we would have to, to have taxes as well on like reduction of of carbon sinks when we deforest and when we have sprawling cities growing new commercial uh, like centers eating up uh, forests and, and agricultural land and that would be much more complicated but that's also very important we can't just you, you know put taxes on pollution there has, there has to be taxes when we like destroy biodiversity and, and things like that what are your thoughts of on that thank you uh, before I let you answer the question, I just want to say there are some people leaving and it's because the time is actually up, but we have this room until 10 o'clock for mingling and so on. So we're going to keep two more questions that already raised the hand. Uh, after that, if you need to leave, just leave and say bye-bye, wave. It's okay, you don't have to feel, too, be, feel too, be, too embarrassed about that, right? So, because time is actually up for, for that, this part. But we're going to keep on with questioning. So if you wouldn't need to leave, it was nice you got here, so yeah. just leave. Okay. So go ahead. Do you remember the, the points? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, there were two questions, uh, and one concerned Uruguay and Paraguay. I'm not that familiar with those countries, but the general question uh, whether GDP is also a measure of uh, distribution or welfare uh, amongst the general population. And of course it's not. I mean, and this is well established uh, amongst economists and sociologists and a lot of scholars, that GDP does not me measure how resources are distributed. But there are other measures of that. Uh, the Gini coefficient is such a measure. So, so, but this is a general critique against the measure of growth, that it doesn't measure how resources are distributed, how it's kind of contributing to environmental degradation and so on. So this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, and uh, of course, this connects to what I talked about before when I said that growth is one thing and uh, redistribution of resources and another thing, and they're not linked necessarily. Uh, and the other question concerned uh, fiscal policies or taxation on environmental degradation as such, not only uh, taxation on um, uh, polluting the air, right? That was the question. Uh, yeah, I'm not that familiar with those kind of policies, I have to confess. And, uh, in the degrowth literature, I'm not really sure how those fiscal policies are dealt with. Um, so this is actually Bond. So mm -hmm. do you have anything to say on that? 
Um, I would say that it is an important point because, yeah, this is how sustainability, um, by addressing one issue, environmental issue, we do not create problems in another, so it is very inherent to degrowth thinking. I'm also not aware of the work exactly on this, but again, for example, the uh, Green New Deal that I have mentioned as part of it, it has the Environmental Justice Commission, So, and it is a way of uh, kind of addressing so when changes are happen and uh, happening and when say um, the fossil energy is substituted by renewable how does that happen and who does it ben uh, benefit because who who kind of uh, um, what happens in transition and if this is say benefiting the countries that are already rich that is a problem so in that sense kind of having environmental justice as a principle on which policies uh, also are based is, is important. And also maybe adding that what you're talking about, maybe we should start pricing the ecosystems. So if you do something for the climate, it will have a big cost on the, on the environment, the local environment, is it then worth it? And maybe we should find a way to price the ecosystem services. So the, I find this yeah. question very interesting yeah. as well. Uh, we had a question, who was the third? third here? Please, you, you, you can get my mic, sorry. Hello, Albert Orling, architect. Um, well, I, uh, I guess from a classic uh, economic economist point of view, uh, a normal critique of the idea of, of not having economic growth is that it would lead to recession due to people becoming unemployed, right? Because, I mean, because production is getting more efficient all the time. If you need 10 people to make a car one year, next year, year you only need nine, next eight. So, so you need the total production to grow in order for people to have a job, right? And uh, um, so, so if you don't have growing production and consumption every year, then there will be less working people, less taxpayers, less public spending funds, and so on, and the economy goes down. So the, uh, this is uh, the explanation you get for, for like the defense of the, the conventional economy. Uh, and so I wonder, in among degrowth intellectuals, is there, um, what's the response to that? What are the ideas of how you might uh, transfer into a non-growing economy without having a lot of unemployment and recession with, and, and still be able to keep a, 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 a um, what do you say, offensively sector, public sector For running. The welfare yeah, system. Welfare system running and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very good question. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, very important question. And again, it brings the issue of just um, transition. So, I would say that growth, it is often assumed that it creates work, but actually a lot of growth today, it's kind of um, capital intensive, let's say. So say the di digitalization and the rise of artificial intelligence, which are the areas which are kind of promising for growth, these are the ones that can make a lot of jobs go. So it's not that growth always comes with, uh, uh, with work and with jobs. And then also another point is that transition or transformation actually, uh, to put it more accurately, it would be also labor intensive. So in that sense, uh, a lot of, um, it would be, the economies would still be uh, there, but they would be different. So it would not be about producing a lot, a lot for the sake of producing, but it would be about maintaining and uh, uh, repairing, for example, the infrastructures that we have or the uh, buildings that, that are there. How to say, um, not build the new housing, but to reuse the kind of spaces that's, that are there and how to maintain them. And it is, I guess, often easier to kind of just uh, uh, knock down a house and build something new with lots of concrete and, uh, uh, and glass and uh, steel and everything. Uh, but then how to kind of, yeah, create this economy around maintenance. And I guess this is what um, be, will be in line with the growth uh, transformation. And then, of course, when having the transition happen, it is important to not leave 
out people who are in the industries that will be phased out. And of course, fossil industry should be phased uh, out and there should be stronger regulation for this and so on. But then the people who are connected to this industry, they have very important knowledge and experience and skills. So in that sense, there should be kind of policies framed to help people um, uh, retrain or to have their skills used for other um, important work that will be uh, there and will be coming. So in that sense, yeah, Just a I, lot of space for work. Yeah, no, but I think this is a really good question and it, it is very much discussed. And, uh, but starting with an observation from the US a few years ago, there was a lot of concern regarding something that they termed jobless growth. So they could see growth, but the new jobs weren't coming. Uh, that has partly changed, but that was the fact for a couple of years, I think before the financial crisis. Uh, so, so the connection between growth and job is not really clear cut. I mean, it could go in, in various directions. Secondly, <clears throat> uh, there is also uh, much discussion about <clears throat> this notion that we have to work longer hours, we have to work until we're 68, 70, in order to have growth. But we, and at least scholars in the degrowth scholarship community, think this is a, a kind of contradictory way of thinking. I mean, if we can afford not to work, why should we then work longer uh, uh, until we're much older? So one of the ideas is that actually we should work less. And if we work less, more people could also get work. So uh, there is this concept of work sharing, that we should share work more equally then. Uh, <clears throat> and that partly addressed that issue, that if we kind of scale down growth or it levels out, uh, then of course there might be the risk that we don't get new jobs, but then we could share the jobs we have. So it's a question of redistribution of work tasks as well. Thank yes. you. Uh, the last official question, and Ahli, before I let you ask the question, mm. uh, I'm, I'm going to ask of you to answer this question as well that somebody signed, because this uh, is uh, about circular economy. And I know, uh, because the question is, why is circular economy only uh, uh, limited to the uh, flows of materials? And not the economy itself. Can you ask that question for us as well? Asking your question. This is Arve, uh, Professor Hervé Corvelec, who, who was part of the second seminar uh, and it, uh, knows a lot about circular economy. This is why I'm asking him the question. <laughs> Hervé Corvelec from Lund University also. Uh, that was a kind of uh, <laughs> surprise. Uh, just uh, two very short comments about degrowth. The first one that if we consider mm -hmm. as exhaustion, as a depletion, of ecosystem services, um, we might just face degrowth not as a choice but as a necessity because we are going to have it right in front of our face. That's what is happening. So maybe we have better to prepare for it, in particular for the redistribution of income policies that you have been discussing. But there is something, and I don't, I'm not sure I agree with you about degrowth, because it's not necessarily a degrowth of money flow which is important, which is also an answer to your question and your question. It's a question of degrowth and reduction of material and energy throughputs, which might be more important. And meaning that, because at the same time that some, some sectors need to degrow, for example, the oil and fossil industry needs to degrow by a factor 30 or 40, other sectors can have a potential for growth. One of the, for example, you mentioned yours, but Latouche has a book in French which says, moins de biens, plus de liens, less goods, more links. So whereas you have, for example, a necessity of degrowth of companies which are throughput material and energy throughput intensive, there is a potential of growth for the sectors which are not material and energy throughput intensive, but which are be link building intensive. So it's a question of, not a question of all companies having to degrow by 20% or 25% or 50% to reach one earth only impact. It's a question of some sectors having a potential to grow because to re, to, so as to replace other sectors which need definitely to degrow because we cannot afford, we cannot afford releasing as much carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases as we do today. So I think we need a more nuanced understanding of degrowth sector by sector and industry by industry. And this might be the answer to your circular yeah. economy question, which means that in some sectors, for example, there is a need of repair 
a repair and maintenance growth, for example. And your answer for your laundry, maybe it's a question of developing a business model where the throughput of material, the throughput of energy for these laundry activities, and I think that it's very relevant for Regions Corner, is sort of reducing the energy use, reducing the amount of cotton coming into the sector and sort of being used. For example, finding ways not to wash laundry which is not in need of being washing and maybe not washing at the necessarily the high temperature because not all the products need to be sort of sanitized the same way. This is, I think, where we can also think of degrowth, sort of trying to invent a new way of working, which is pretty much the circular economy. Sorry for not answering completely your question. No, it's good correct. enough. Um, Comment? Yeah, thank that. you so much, Hervé, for clarifying. And this is already part of what the growth is about. So sorry if we were not that clear uh, or as clear as Hervé has been. So it is not, the growth is not about everything kind of uh, uh, getting smaller. It is about reduction on mat of material and energy throughput and not having growth as a kind of goal in itself. But of course, in some areas and some sectors, there is the space for, uh, for expansion and for uh, even growing, to use this word. But it is not something that should be uh, like the uh, the goal. So thanks for clarifying, I can only say. <laughs> yeah, and adding to that, you could say, I mean, if we move in that direction, Hervé, of course, eventually we would see decoupling uh, if those kind of sectors grew that uh, invest in kind of sustainable technologies or green technologies. Yeah, but then eventually we will have decoupling and that would be great, of course. But so far we're not seeing that. No. So, I mean, and that's where the degrowth discussion comes up. And I think Serge Latouche also so that. Yes. by adding value with higher quality, we can also, of course, have some sort of monetary growth, but have less impact on, on the planet. Yeah. But why don't we see this decoupling? Yeah. Why don't we see this? What is wrong with the current system? Do you expect us to answer that? <laughs> yeah, because we are talking about we don't yes. see the decoupling. Yeah. Yeah, is no. it because it's not work? It, it, it's simply not possible within the system. Is that the final yeah. conclusion? Yeah. We can? Yeah. Okay. So we need system change. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, we have time for mingle for those of you who have time, but we should work less. So maybe you do have time to mingle. <laughs> or, uh, yes. uh, but thank you so much and applaud, please. Uh, thank you so much. Before I let you off stage, I want to ask Pat to come back on stage and to, find, to say some final words to, to the audience, of course, and to our excellent speakers. Uh, right. Uh, no, 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 no. Closer, of course, always forgetting. Rustan has already thanked our uh, pres <coughs> presenter. Uh, sorry. <laughs> our, uh, no, no, I can't find any sweet English word. But anyway, I also like to do it because it was a very interesting morning. And I think most of us here find it very interesting. And not only interesting, but it's something that we may need to act on, not just talk about. And Rustan, you have, as always, been a very, very good moderator. And I think Rustan is also worth an applaud. Yeah. <laughs> and all of you, thank you for attending. I have very nice questions, and I hope we can come up with some other seminars as interesting as this. So thank you for today.